Welcome uh, to our families and participants. I am gonna ask um, that we wait a few minutes to ensure that everyone who wants to log on can do so, and then we'll begin. And uh, while we certainly appreciate um, the sharing of many reactions, we would ask that participants um, pause on the emojis while we give the presentation. Thank you. So at this time, I'm going to invite the panelists to uh, open their cameras. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Fulton Hale. I'm the principal at Maryville High School, one of the two OCDSB IB diploma schools uh, in our district. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my uh, colleague, Trevor Grills, over at Colonel By. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Grills, and I'm the principal at Colonel By. So uh, before we begin our presentation, which will be uh, primarily facilitated by our IB coordinators, I want to acknowledge that together and this evening, we are gathered across Ottawa Carleton on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin peoples and the Anishinaabe. We thank them for their stewardship, for their care of the land, for their generosity in teaching us about reconciliation and working with us as we do uh, the important work in schools each and every day uh, to align ourselves more closely with uh, our, our community and the people around us. And we think about the work and the connection to the land and the places that we learn each and every day. Um, as we go through this presentation, families will notice that there's a Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We would like you to put your questions in uh, that section. As the um, presentation uh, unfolds over the evening, we'll be going through those questions and inviting uh, panelists to address them. There will also be a time at the end of the presentation for us to address your questions as well. One of the things that we do ask uh, both students and families to consider is that this is um, a recorded presentation and we would like you to um, be thoughtful in your questions because we will not be addressing questions that are highly personalized and individualized. Uh, those questions need to be emailed to the schools and at the end of the presentation that contact information will be shared with you and uh, individual and very specific questions uh, should be addressed uh, offline. Um, Mr. Harthen, did you want to have opening remarks before we get going? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Fulton Hale. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Lewis Harthen, and uh, I am the proud coordinator at both uh, Colonel By Secondary School and Maryville High School. So uh, I get to oversee the program at, at both sites, but um, Helping me in that because it's a very large task are, and joining us this evening are Miss Jennifer Lee and Miss Elizabeth Dutton. Uh, Miss Lee is the um, coordinator at Colonel By Secondary School and Miss Dutton is the coordinator at Maryville High School. Now, before we uh, get underway, I'm gonna share my screen in just a second and I'm actually uh, gonna turn it back over to our two principals. Um, we are going to spend a good amount of time talking about the IB program, but I thought before we would do that, uh, we would give each of them a little opportunity to talk about their own sites, which I know they're uh, both very proud of. So I'm just going to share my screen and then I will turn it over uh, to the two of you. So just one moment, please.
All right. Uh, well, um, I will take the opportunity to share a little bit about Maryville High School before turning uh, the floor over to my colleague Trevor at Colonel By. Uh, Maryville is the second site in the OCDSB that was authorized as an IB school, and we received our authorization in 2019. Uh, but I think what is really important for families to know is that Maryville is a community school. We are configured as a 7 to 12 school, which means that we have a, an intermediate uh, division as well as a secondary division. And like all schools in the OCDSB, uh, English uh, pathways, French immersion pathways, and of course, our diploma pathways, which you're here to learn about today. Maravelle is uh, a school that has um, a history. Uh, the school was built in the mid 60s. So we have a whole range of academic experiences for students to explore, including uh, hard technology courses, construction and um, automotive. Uh, we have an incredible arts program, and you'll hear more about that from Ms. Dutton, of course, but visual arts, drama, music, and uh, our academic pathways, which include every group in the IB uh, circle, languages, uh, sciences, maths, uh, Canada World Studies, uh, the whole works. We always like to say that big becomes small when you get involved. So students have the opportunity in arts and in athletics uh, to be involved in extracurricular. And that includes clubs and teams and uh, a range of experiential learning opportunities. Over to you, Mr. Grills. Great, thanks, Jean. So like I mentioned earlier, my name is Trevor and I'm the, the proud principal at Colonel By. Uh, we're located in the Beacon Hill neighborhood uh, near Ogilvy and, and Montreal Road. Uh, the, the population of Colonel By, we're sitting at around 1,100 students, and, and we have students from grade 9 to grade 12 here at Colonel By. Uh, similar to, to the program at Merivale, we, we also offer programming uh, in, in English and French immersion. Um, and we, we do really focus on academics, the athletics, and the arts as well. Uh, we have a very, very active student body with, with over 35 active clubs that meet weekly, a uh, full complement of, of individual and team sports. Uh, we have a, an arts program with opportunities uh, in visual arts, uh, instrumental music, drama, and musical theater. Uh, I'm in a really unique situation uh, because I've just arrived here to Colonel By in September. And um, so, so joining a new school is, is something that's really, really familiar to me. And so the one thing that I've really remarked about Colonel By is just how welcoming that the students are. Uh, I've noticed that students go out of their way to take time to introduce themselves to, to their, their peers and, and to their, their teaching staff as well. Uh, it really does make Colonel By a wonderful place to, to spend each day. I, I would also encourage uh, everyone that's on the, the call tonight to, to take the time to visit our website. Uh, there's a lot of information at our website, thekernelby.com. Um, it gives you a really good view of what we do on a daily basis, and, and it would encourage you to watch some of our Cougar Vision videos, uh, it, as that will give you a true sense of, of everything that we have to offer. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you to both of our principals for, for those great introductions to the schools and um, and the coordinators uh, from this point are going to take it over. So um, let's talk a little bit uh, about IB. Now, um, I always start with what IB is and uh, it stands for International Baccalaureate. So when we say IB, what we're really saying is International Baccalaureate. Now, I've had a chance to visit um, all of our OCDSB schools that have grade eight students, and they can tell you from the presentations that I might have given some of them, is that we kind of toss away the second word uh, baccalaureate when we talk about this program. Uh, but what we do like to focus on is the word international. And so um, I want to start there uh, with the adults and, and maybe some students who are watching at home. So this really is a program that you can find uh, all around the world. So the idea of being an IB World School truly means that, that there are um, many other schools uh, in the world that offer this. In fact, you would be very hard pressed to walk into any country in the world uh, and not find an IB World School uh, wherever you happen to be. So um, when we talk about this as being a global program, you'll see us talk about the uh, international mindedness element uh, in this program. Uh, it's because this program exists literally all across uh, the planet. And so we're very fortunate in the OCDSB to have two IB World schools um, that uh, 
we have available to students. And as you kind of saw, Colonel By was the established one for a really long time. And then we were fortunate enough to get Maryville authorized in 2019. Now, I always like to start here because we do have two schools. And I know this question comes up often uh, when we talk about uh, the program and how it works. And the reason I like to start here is with geography. Now you heard um, <laughs> our two principals talk about where their schools were. And um, geography plays an important role in which school you might apply to if you think that this is a program that you are interested in. And so um, one of the pieces that we encourage you to do is to look up the uh, IB school locator, uh, which is part of our application uh, process to see which school uh, you might zone into based on your address. So uh, anytime in the OCDSB where we tend to have more than one option with the same program, uh, we usually have a boundary associated with that. And that boundary would have been determined by our school board trustees uh, when Maribel was authorized. So we do encourage you to start with that OCDSB IB school locator, uh, just to check out which school it is that you uh, should be applying to if it's a program of interest. The other reason I always like you to start off with the OCSB IB school locator and perhaps a, a mapping piece of your choice has to do with transportation in the program. And so in our school board, as far as this program goes, we have a rule that if you are within 3.2 kilometers or farther than 3.2 kilometers walking distance from the school, uh, you might qualify for transportation. And so at the high school level, uh, this can look a couple of different ways, and it is determined by uh, the Auto Student Transportation Authority, or OSTA, that some of you might be familiar with. And so those two main forms of transportation usually look like either an OC Transpo bus pass, which is the most common, uh, or possibly a yellow school bus, or perhaps even a van, depending on where you might live geographically in the city. But that is determined by OSTA, and I know sometimes the adults watching at home have a lot of questions about how uh, their children might get to uh, and from school. And um, as I say, we do provide transportation in these situations uh, for you. Another really interesting piece about Maryville and Colonel By is that we are non-semestered. Uh, and so that's a little bit different than all of the other high schools in the city, actually. And so when I say that we're non-semestered, uh, traditionally, high schools uh, in Ottawa operate on a semestered system. And what that looks like, just so uh, adults at home can hear this and students if they're not aware of it, in a semestered system, uh, you start the year with four classes. And so you would start with those four classes in September and you would take them every single day until about February. And then those four classes finish, they're done uh, and they go away. And then you start four new classes in February and you take those every single day until the end of June, and then they're done, and that's your school year. And so in a typical high school year, a student takes eight courses, um, and they finish there, but we have in a semester system, four in one half of the year and four in the other, or as we call them, semester one and semester two. At Colonel By and Maryville, we actually operate on a non-semestered system. And so what that looks like is your child would actually start the year with eight classes. And so they'll have eight classes that they take throughout the school year. And here's how it functions on a day-to-day -day basis. So today, let's say it's Tuesday, and let's say we have English, math, French, and phys ed today. Um, we would have English, math, French, and phys ed again on Thursday, because tomorrow we're going to have the other four classes in our schedule. And so it alternates four, four, or if you want to think of it as day one, day two, um, throughout the entirety of the school year. So our students are engaged uh, in their classes, all eight of their classes throughout the entirety of the school year. And the reason that that happens is, has a lot to do with us being an IB World School. Uh, and so at an IB World School, IB really values something called concurrency of education. And that's a really big educational way of saying that they think it's important uh, that kids study their classes all year round. And so it's this big belief in IB that if you study your classes all year round, um, we get to see what you're capable of in all of your courses. And so um, when I go out into schools, I usually ask kids, I try to make this practical for them in this way. Uh, I usually ask them, because they're actually at the perfect age for this, 
I usually ask them if in the last little while they have experienced a growth spurt. Um, so to the adults at home, you might know if the teenager beside you has gotten a little bit taller, right? For some of us, maybe we're finally looking up at them instead of down and um, they've gotten just that little bit bigger. And then I usually follow it up by asking them if anybody is still waiting for their growth spurt. And we have some students who, of course, identify as, yeah, I'm still waiting. I haven't quite uh, caught up in that particular way. And so what I like to do when I talk about concurrency of education is kind of look at it as a growth spurt as to why we do this. And so in IB, IB kind of takes the approach that kids will have learning growth spurts at different points during the year. And so for some students, they're going to start off in September and they're going to feel really well adjusted to high school and everything's just going to kind of click. Uh, and that's phenomenal uh, in that situation for a student. They get to go off and enjoy their learning growth spurt, as it were, across the whole school year. But more practically, what happens is sometimes it takes a little bit longer. And so we might have that learning growth spurt a little bit later or it's gradual throughout the year. And so it's kind of growth slow growth in that way. And so concurrency of education, uh, according to IB and how they look at it, really gives students an opportunity to show what they're capable of in all eight of their subjects all year round. So they get that opportunity to enjoy that learning growth spurt and really showcase um, their capabilities. And as they go through the curriculum uh, at that pace and throughout the whole year, they really get a little bit more time to uh, engage with the material because it's not quite every single day we've got a little bit longer in between classes there as well so that's an opportunity that we see for students in the ib program and that's why we are non-semestered sites one of the other big things that ib really believes in uh, is being very well rounded and so for us that kind of starts in grade 9 and 10. so for us at colonel by and maryville grade 9 and 10 our preparatory years because the formal IB diploma program actually starts in grade 11 and 12. So what happens in grade 9 and 10 is students take a wide variety of courses. And so one of the reasons that they're doing this is they are meeting uh, the graduation requirements of both the Ontario Secondary School Diploma while still preparing for what will happen uh, in the IB diploma in grade 11 and 12. And so grade nine and 10 for us, we are preparing students. We're really focusing on a slightly different skill set than you might see in some of the Ontario classes because we're looking for uh, what we know the IBO values ultimately in their curriculum and on their assessment tasks. So we're kind of focusing in grade nine and 10 on developing those skills in students uh, and trying to build things like their time management skills, um, their research skills, which you'll hear me talk about a little bit more later. Um, and so grade nine and 10 for us are a preparatory program, but it's a very well-rounded preparatory program because in IB, um, one of the requirements is that students take a very well-rounded uh, group of courses. Now, one thing parents at home may or may not know is that in the Ontario Secondary School Diploma, uh, what happens in grade nine and 10 is kind of exactly what you're seeing here. It's a pretty well-rounded uh, buffet of courses. But as you get a little bit older in high school, um, if you were in the Ontario Secondary School uh, program, one of the things that you can do is you can kind of avoid certain subject areas if you really wanted to, uh, and you would still graduate from high school. Um, in the Ontario program, that's definitely an option, but in the IB program, it's not. So in the IB program, one of the things that we really kind of put in play is that you have to be well-rounded in your course selections throughout all of high school and not just grade nine and 10. And so what we're gonna see next is um, this curriculum model. And so this is the IB curriculum model. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each area. And I'm gonna ask Ms. Lee and Ms. Dutton at a certain point to step in because they actually have teaching experience in some of these areas. Um, and so they're gonna speak to those areas. So this is the curriculum model for all of IB. And what you'll see in um, the sort of second circle um, from the outside is uh, the course groups that all kids in the IB program must take part in. And so in order to earn an IB diploma, you must take at least one course from these six different subject areas. Now, the first one that I'll talk about a little bit is 
studies in language and literature. What that means practically for students is that they will take English class for four years. To be fair, in the Ontario program, you also take English class for four years because it's an Ontario graduation requirement. What the IB course does, um, and it's focused primarily when we look at studies in language and literature, is it's a really intense breakdown uh, of what language is and how it informs meaning. Um, I'm speaking as somebody who has um, a graduate degree in English when I say this. Um, it's the type of preparation that you might consider if you were going to go into a program like that. And so when I say we're breaking down what particular words do in terms of a sentence or, or giving meaning to something, um, we're really focusing on why would an author maybe use this word instead of this word? Is there a difference in word choice? How might this actually develop the overall message that this person is trying to convey? And so studies in language and literature is a really focused look at how our language, the ones that we use every day to communicate, how it actually gives meaning. The second thing that students uh, must do is they must study uh, a second language. That's the language acquisition group. And so um, for our students, to choose a, a second language to study throughout high school. The most common choice amongst most of our students um, is French. And so in that particular area, we have both immersion and core options. So if you are in French immersion right now and wondering, can I be in French immersion and in IB? The answer is yes. You can still, uh, still complete the requirements for the OCDSB French immersion certificate while being in the program. Uh, and so that is still an option for you. If you are, of course, in core French, you can continue in core French. Um, but one of the other options that we offer in the language acquisition category is Spanish. And so uh, if students are looking for a language that perhaps they know a little bit from home, um, but if they're also looking for a language that perhaps they don't know and they want to just start learning, Spanish might be an option for some of our students. Uh, the third group uh, is individuals and societies. And what that means practically uh, is that students will take social sciences uh, throughout all of high school. And so um, our social science courses really focus very intently on uh, field work and having a look at uh, being involved and, and understanding different forms of research across the social sciences. And so there's a really big research focus in our social science courses at both Colonel By and Maryville. And so we try to push kids towards understanding that uh, it's not just about memorization, it's actually about unpacking things and understanding uh, how various subjects in the social sciences work. For the fourth group, I am actually gonna turn it over to Miss Lee, who in addition to being um, one of the school-based IB coordinators here at Colonel By, uh, is also a phenomenal science teacher. And I think she's probably the best uh, choice here out of all of us to maybe talk a little bit about the sciences. So Miss Lee, over to you. Hi, sure. Uh, so in the sciences in grade nine and 10 uh, in the IB program, they are uh, taking the, the same range of uh, subjects as, as in the Ontario program. So they will get exposure to biology, chemistry, physics, and earth sciences. Uh, in the IB program, we're really focusing on developing inquiry skills. Uh, so right from the start, they will be looking at developing testable questions. Uh, how are they going to answer those questions? How do you gather data? How do you... Um, organize that data? How do you analyze it? How do you draw conclusions? And so we start building those skills uh, right from the very beginning. And then that's going to uh, continue on in grade 11 and 12. We offer uh, four choices of, of IB sciences. We offer biology, chemistry, physics, and we also offer uh, sports exercise, health science. And uh, so these are some choices that, that students have that they can make uh, to fulfill their IB diploma requirements. Um, and by the time they get to grade 11 and 12, they'll have uh, a really good handle on those inquiry skills that they're going to need to be successful in those courses. Awesome. Thank you, Miss Lee. Appreciate that. Um, the fifth group that students must in, engage in uh, is mathematics. And so I always say this one uh, because I know for some of our audience, uh, that's really super exciting. And for some of our audience, sometimes that might um, cause a little bit of anxiety when I say that you have to take math uh, for all four years of high school. And so um, 
I do want to introduce math and in, in the IB in a very particular way. And so um, IB has a lot of different math courses and there are uh, math courses for students at virtually every level. And so I do want people to hear that. Um, we do have math courses that um, do everything from co cover basically all of first year university mathematics, what you might find there, to courses that will prepare kids to confidently walk into first year college or university math and feel really great about walking in, to courses that are a little bit more stats and data management driven. And so what I want uh, this audience to hear is that we have a lot of different mathematics options and we do try to meet uh, the students where they are with their math level and, and help them improve their confidence in mathematics. So whether they're feeling super confident and can't wait to write their next math competition, uh, or if they're thinking, wow, I, I really wish I understood this a bit more, we do try to meet kids at that level. And there is always a pathway in the IB program, regardless of how you're feeling about uh, math as an option. Um, the sixth group uh, is the arts. And again, I'm very fortunate that I have Ms. Dutton with me because uh, she is definitely our, our arts expert here on the panel, um, because in addition to being the school-based coordinator at Maryville, uh, she's also a teacher in the arts at uh, Maryville. So Ms. Dutton, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about arts and what arts education is like in the IB program. All right, thank you. Uh, so the IB arts allows students to explore the diversity of the arts across time, cultures, and contexts as they develop their imagination and their skills within the arts. Uh, in the IB Arts, we focus not just on the final product, but also on the creative process and how you got from your initial idea to that final product. So there's a big emphasis on reflecting on the journey you took to get from start to finish. We work on the skills and theory behind the arts that enable students to develop their creative thinking skills and their critical thinking skills which can be applied not only within the arts, but to other areas of life as well. Students learn how to work not only as a creator, but also as a collaborator. And they learn to express their ideas in a creative way as they work on exploring, experimenting, and creating in the arts. Through this program, one of our aims is to enable students to enjoy a lifelong engagement with the arts. Awesome, thank you very much, Ms. Dutton. Now, um, as Ms. Dutton has, has just talked about the arts education, um, one of the things that IB does allow um, in, in that last group, and, and I will mention here just in case, because I know in addition to math, sometimes, um, strangely enough, the arts can sometimes cause a little bit of anxiety for folks as well who might sit there and, and think, oh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that, that that part is me necessarily, or I don't necessarily consider myself a super arts-based student. So IB does, allow for an option here. We definitely uh, encourage students to consider the arts and getting um, more skills in, in some of the arts programs that we offer at Colonel Bayon Maribel, but in IB students do have an option to fulfill that sixth requirement. Uh, they can take an additional uh, second language should they wish, uh, but they could also take an additional social science or an additional science class. So there are different ways of satisfying that arts requirement in the IB uh, should a student um, not want to increase their skills in that particular area or, or doesn't feel a particular comfort there. So that is definitely an option. And so that is the sort of six group well-roundedness as far as courses go uh, for the IB program. But what actually really makes uh, IB quite unique uh, are the what we call the three core requirements uh, of the program. And those are um, CAS, Creativity, Activity, and Service, uh, the Extended Essay, or the EE as we sometimes call it, uh, and TOK, or Theory of Knowledge class. And so I do want to spend a little time talking about them because I think they are three elements that really uh, separate what happens in the IB program from what you might experience uh, in our Ontario Secondary School Diploma program. Um, and so the first one I'm going to talk about is, uh, is CAS or Creativity, Activity and Service. And CAS is probably uh, the one that might seem most familiar relative to, um, relative to what the Ontario high school experience is like. So you might be aware that in order to graduate high school in the province of Ontario, uh, that you must complete 40 hours of community service uh, at some point. And, and CAS kind of has that element uh, to it 
uh, in that there definitely is a service component there. Um, but it actually does a whole lot more uh, than, than simply look at the hours that a student uh, spends. So in the, for the Ontario Secondary School Diploma, what uh, an interaction might look like is a student would maybe find a volunteer opportunity in the community or possibly at school. Um, they would go there and they would help out um, and, and, and do work there. And then they would have a supervisor kind of sign off that they had been there and volunteered for however many hours it was. And that student might then return to school uh, with that signed form and, and give it into the uh, office or at guidance and say, you know, here's what I've done. And the school would log those hours for them. And so they would say, okay, great. You've done X number of hours. We will uh, count that towards your graduation requirement. And that's, that's kind of it. Um, what happens in IB is we still value uh, students going out into the community, but we actually really want students to spend time thinking about um, what they're doing. And so we want them to think about what they're doing. And more importantly, we want them to think about how what they're doing kind of makes them who they are, how it develops them as a human being. And so one thing we often say about IB is that it's not just well-rounded from a course perspective. We actually really care about students as human beings and how they're going to develop. And so we ask them to do a lot of reflection uh, on who they are. We ask them to do a lot of reflection in classwork as well, but in CAS, what we really focus on is who are you outside of the classroom? And so one of the founding ideas in CAS is that what happens outside of the classroom is as important as what happens inside of the classroom. And so we really want kids to take into account those activities and, and think about how they make them who they are. And so IB actually breaks it into three different areas. They consider all students capable of being creative, so hence creativity. They consider all students capable of being active, hence activity. And they consider all students capable of doing um, some form of service learning, hence the service component. And one thing I always tell kids is um, this is not meant to be an add-on to the program. It's actually meant to look at what you do already in your life. And so I'm very fond of asking this question when I go to visit uh, different schools. I was asked, how many of you are playing a musical instrument this year? And of course, hands go up. And so for us, that would be considered an example of something that is creative. And so students might think about how playing a musical instrument uh, develops them, right? What does it do for them? How does it bring them joy? Does it, how, how does that work for them? For activity, we do the same thing. We ask kids, I will sometimes ask kids, they've taken part in athletics at school or in the community, uh, or if they've joined intramurals, or if they do something else that might be considered uh, you know, as simple as going for a bike ride. Um, so we look at that and we say, how is that stuff important to your life? And then we would ask them, how many of you have ever volunteered ever? Uh, and usually almost all the hands go up, whether it's around school or in the community. And then we ask them to think about how their time um, giving back has actually been meaningful and develops them. So um, as I go into schools, uh, what I do usually is when I get to this portion, uh, I talk a little bit about um, an activity that my daughter's involved in. And so one of the things that uh, she does uh, in her spare time uh, is she plays uh, high level competitive soccer. And so I'll give you an example of how that might work in cast, just so you can see how that reflective element comes to be. So um, depending on the time of year, she's probably on the field or training or doing something. Um, it could be as many as 15 to 20 hours a week and sometimes more if we throw in travel. And so in a program like this, one of the things we would ask her to do is to think about uh, why she plays soccer. And so we might say, why do you do that? That's a lot of your time that you actually invest in, in doing something. And so she has an opportunity to think about, well, why do I do this, right? And um, as a young person getting a chance to think about that and, and kind of reflect on, okay, why is this important and meaningful to me? Uh, it's actually a really big deal um, because it's an opportunity for them to get to know themselves a little bit rather than just that thing that you do. It's kind of sitting back and being able to say, okay, well, why I'm getting to that age, why is this important to me? And so we might then ask, she might then have to think about, well, how does this develop me as a person? And so I don't just necessarily mean as a soccer player. So if she's doing all this training, um, 
you know, athletically, she's, she's a pretty good athlete. So she might say, how does being healthy and active actually help me in life? Never mind just soccer. How is that beneficial to me in life? So this activity I'm doing, how does it develop me as a human? She might also sit back and say, soccer is a team game. And so in order to achieve success, I have to work with my teammates. How does that work? So she might say, you know what? It's important that I develop those those team skills here in soccer, but they also help me in life. So she might say at school, I have to do group work. And so having those skills developed in a different setting, I can carry those over. Or she might be able to say, I have a part-time job. How does that help me in my job? And so that reflective element, we ask kids to take the things that they do and kind of look at why they're so important to make them who they are as a human being. And, and IB, that's a really big emphasis on who you are as a person and how you develop as a person. Um, the second one uh, that I wanna talk about, the second core requirement is called um, the extended essay. And it, quite honestly, uh, sometimes the one kids find frightening. And so the extended essay is, and you can probably see it up on the screen, uh, it's a 4,000 word research essay. And um, when I say that usually in schools, uh, a few jaws drop and there's uh, some audible noise in, in the crowd because quite likely um, most kids have not written a 4,000 word research paper. Um, and if we're going to be honest, um, most high schools don't have 4,000 word research essays. And possibly if we're gonna be even a little bit more honest, um, a lot of times you're not necessarily even going to see a 4,000 word research essay in the first few years of college or university either. Um, so it really is a task that is pretty large in comparison to what your average uh, high school student might have to do. And so one of the things that we always like to point out importantly is that this research essay does not begin in the ninth grade. It's not as if we look at students who walk in the door of either Colonel By or Maryville and say, could you please hand in that 4,000 word essay we were expecting? Uh, what actually happens is we really try to focus on building student research skills in all subjects in ninth, 10th, and in fact, even through 11th and 12th grade. Uh, because what we ultimately do is in the 11th grade, uh, we start talking about the extended essay a little bit more and about halfway through a student's 11th grade year, um, we start really focusing on the extended essay because we usually find by that point with all of the skills that we've developed in research and in different classes, um, students actually feel a little bit prepared to take this on. So they have a really good idea of how they might start to go about this task. And so kids who are writing the extended essay actually get put as the center uh, of learning on this task. And so they are actually the ones who choose the subject and the topic of their paper. So this isn't perhaps like your typical school assignment where your teacher might say, this is what you are writing about. We actually turn the tables on that and we say, actually, you're the center here. You're the person who's in charge of the learning. And we really trust you to pick a subject and topic that you are maybe passionate about that you want to explore a little bit farther or one that you want to study a little bit later maybe, and perhaps at post-secondary or something you want to pursue. And so we give kids that opportunity to choose and really feel um, empowered in, in their choice. And so what we do after that choice is made is uh, we pair each student up with a supervisor who is a teacher uh, at the school. And so those supervisors actually serve as mentors uh, to our students uh, through the writing process. And so they'll have some formal meetings with their mentors and they can access them in, in other ways as well outside of those formal meetings. But what happens is they're actually guided through how to get through a 4,000 word research paper, how to go about doing things. And so we give them a fair amount of time to write it. It's actually typically due um, just around the middle of the 12th grade is usually when we have the extended essay due. And so kids actually have a substantial amount of time to work on this project and get through it. And so as we're going through this, at the end, we actually have a really big reflective component uh, on the essay. And so we ask kids to think about how the process went. We're not necessarily talking about how they might feel about the final paper, which is usually pretty good, but we ask them to consider the process. And so we say, you know, what did you learn from doing something like this? This was a really big task. How has this developed your skill set? Are there things you would do differently? Are there things that you've learned from this that you could carry forward? And um, one of the things we often find is that students, even many years after, 
um, write us and, and talk a little bit about um, their extended essay experience. And so they might say something like, I'm applying to grad school or I'm applying to med school and I need to talk about something that I did uh, in my past that was really meaningful to me. And, and that extended essay really taught me how to do research. It really taught me how to focus and do big tasks. And so for me, that's my meaningful piece. And that's something that they did across grade 11 and 12 in the IB program. And so we know the benefits of that can be really long lasting. So I know, and kids, I know you're at home thinking, wait a second, you're, you're trying to sweet talk us into a 4,000 word research essay. Um, <laughs> I promise you that there are really long lasting benefits to that type of task. And well, so- <laughs> Mr. Hearth, and I just have to interrupt you briefly uh, you because can. we've had a number of questions come up uh, in the Q&A section that ask if the students can start this opportunity sooner. So maybe you can just focus on why we wait till grade 11. Yes, thank you, no problem. Uh, that's a great question, can we start it early? Um, so the answer is no. Um, and so part of it is because there's a two pronged answer to this. So the, if there's both are official answers. And so one is that we really do need to spend some time with you getting our research skills uh, owned up to be ready to start a task like this. It's one of those pieces where um, we want to prepare you to take ownership of the task. And that does take some time, uh, quite honestly. I know some of us are thinking, I can own that task right now. Um, but you'll kind of see as you go through some of the coursework uh, that it takes a little bit more um, than that eagerness. We love your eagerness, but it takes a little bit more in terms of training and skills where we get you to that point. The other official reason though, is that um, the IB diploma program doesn't formally start until grade 11. And so uh, we cannot complete components uh, of the program um, before you actually start the program. And so that's actually an IB rule. Uh, and so we start, the pro we start those components in grade 11. So I appreciate the eagerness, but uh, no, we can't start that one uh, early. So yeah, I know. Um, so we're going to go through uh, and, and teach you how to take control of this really large task, which will ultimately have um, some really long lasting benefits for you. The third requirement uh, is something called, you have to take a course called uh, TOK or Theory of Knowledge class. And um, usually when I go into schools, um, I get the really great opportunity to do a TOK activity with uh, everybody. And it's, it's probably my most enjoyable part of the presentation. I like it all, but that's definitely the most enjoyable part. And often what happens, and, and some, I'm not sure adults, maybe some of your kids went home and asked you this question as well. But one of the questions I ask when I have kids in front of me is I ask them to answer what I call a really easy math question. And that math question is uh, usually what is one raindrop plus one raindrop? And so it solicits some different answers. But for this type of piece, I thought I would give um, an opportunity to maybe for us to have a, a home exercise. And so if you are watching this with somebody, I'm going to ask you to kind of take part in our impromptu online um, TOK activity. And let's just see how this goes. OK, so. Up here, what you'll see is uh, a pair of sneakers, okay? And so you'll see it with TOK and theory of knowledge, and you might be thinking, what do sneakers have to do with theory of knowledge class? This seems like unlike any other class I've heard of. Um, and so we're gonna do a little quick activity. So assuming that you can see the sneakers on your screen, uh, what I'm gonna ask you to look at specifically are the shoelaces, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to look at the shoelaces. And there's one thing I need you to do. And, and kids, if you've had me at your school, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, I'm going to ask you to think of the answer to the question, what color are the shoelaces in your head without saying it out loud? OK, so if you're sitting here with a couple of people watching it, you know, if you have some adults around you and students, I want you all to think of the answer in your head, but not say it out loud. And so. We all have the answer to what color the shoelaces are in our head. And on the count of three, I want you to look at the people beside you and say what color the shoelaces are, okay? So one, two, three. 
And so chances are it's possible that what just happened is you looked at somebody uh, you've maybe known your whole life and they have a different answer than you do about what color those shoelaces are. Uh, and so you might, some of you might think blue, some of you might think green, some of you might think aqua, some of you might think whatever color you might think those shoelaces are. And there's a lot of different answers we usually get um, if we do the shoelace question. And one of the important parts about this is um, that those answers all kind of contribute to what this course actually is about. Because what we actually focus on in a course like TOK is how you know what you know. And so where we might start is we might ask somebody um, how they came up with the answer in their head. So we might say, how did you come up with what color those shoelaces were? And so over the times I've done this exercise before, some people will say, well, I said that it was aqua because when I was a kid, uh, I had a box of Crayola crayons and um, that was what the color was called on the, on the crayon. It said aqua. And so I'm saying aqua. And somebody else will say, you know, that is, I think that's, I think it's green because I have a sweater like that and it was called green when I bought it. Or somebody might have a different answer. And actually what we really focus on is, okay, how did you come up with your answer? Because you as a person, you're a knower, you know things, okay? And so as somebody who knows things, what we ask you to do is to consider how do you know, right? So how do you know what you know? And then we do one other piece that's really actually quite crucial. We ask you to consider if it's possible that if you know that the shoelaces are aqua and somebody else thinks the shoelaces are, let's say, blue or green, is it possible that you might both be right? And so one of the things that IB really truly believes in, and it's right in their mission statement, is the idea that others with their differences might also be right. And that's actually a really big statement, especially when we're talking about something like, what is the answer to this question? And so what we do in TOK is we really ask kids to think about how do you know what you know but is it possible that somebody else with different life experience uh, might also arrive at a right answer? And for us, that is such an important question when we look at the makeup of students in our program, because one of the things um, that I can tell you about students in the IB program is that we have a very broad, diverse range of students with a lot of different student backgrounds. Um, and it's something that we really cherish in the program. And so, what we really want is this bigger dialogue about how we are uh, informing, how we know what we know, and then how does uh, somebody else with a different life experience know what they know. One thing we know about um, the world is that it's a very globalized place. And in fact, uh, it might even be, it's probably a little bit different than when, you know, myself or maybe some adults at home uh, were kids. So the reality is if your uh, child sitting there at home wants to get in touch with somebody halfway around the world, they can do it really quickly nowadays. In fact, if they're on social media, they probably do it every single day. What we want people to be able to understand is how do I know what I know? How is my perspective there? But also how does my perspective relate and engage to the broader world? Because there are different ways of knowing out there. And so we really encourage students to be internationally minded. Now, another really unique thing about TOK, and it's one of the things that really makes the IB program very different from the Ontario Secondary School Diploma Program, is that TOK is cross-disciplinary. In other words, TOK, it exists as its own subject, but it is actually embedded in every single IB subject. And so all of the subjects that a student takes in, in IB as part of those six groups, they all have embedded within it TOK. And so TOK actually binds the entire course and program together. And so um, what I like to say is these types of conversations of how you know what you know are actually prevalent in all of our classes because they're all built in. And that's a little bit different than the Ontario Secondary School Diploma experience where perhaps your English class and your math class um, maybe don't have to talk to each other because they are completely separate curriculum. In IB, all of that curriculum is actually intertwined uh, through the lens of TOK and through that scope. And so all of this comes together. Uh, and that's a really meaningful experience to have all of your courses kind of there. In fact, uh, I know Ms. Lee uh, can tell you this and, and Ms. Dutton can probably tell you this from the classroom experience, but 
Um, occasionally, I, I, I get a chance to go in and uh, observe some IB classes. And one of the things that is very common in that experience is I will go into, uh, let's say, Miss Lee's biology class as an example, and she will be teaching a lesson uh, and a student will, will remark to something that she said, that is so T-OK what you just said about something in biology. And then, you know, I could go down and see Miss Dutton's music class and she'll be talking about something to do with uh, with music and a student will say the exact same line. They will say, that is so T-OK to something that Miss Dutton is teaching in music class. And so that kind of connectivity for students really glues this program together and really provides a really robust experience uh, for students. Now, Ms. Yeah. Mr. Hart, then can I interrupt you again for a few more you questions? May. Absolutely. All right. Uh, first things first, we've had a number of our viewers ask for those people who are having a lot of fun with the emoji reactions. Can you please uh, stop? Uh, people are finding it very distracting. And then I have two questions for our co-coordinators. I'm going to start with Miss Lee for the extended essay. We've had a number of questions about where students do their research, if they wish to do science, is there lab space? And I wonder if you could just expand a little bit before we move on to our next section. Sure, happy to do that. Um, if the students in the sciences, I'll start with that one first. If the students would like to uh, do a, a hands-on experiment, absolutely, that is possible. And, and we encourage students to, to choose an area that they can pursue. Um, because the bulk of the research is done over the summer uh, between grade 11 and 12, uh, there is no lab facilities available at the school. There may be a few things that they may be able to do at the school uh, early on in the process. There may be some things that they could do at the school, um, say, in the fall of grade 12. But generally speaking, this is a project that is to be completed uh, independently. Sometimes students may, on their own, make arrangements uh, to, to do an experiment in another facility, but it's absolutely not required. Uh, and certainly the, the extended essay guidelines talk about the, the value in, in doing experiments uh, that can be conducted with uh, simple materials at home or uh, in the environment. They could do things um, you know, such as biodiversity measurements in, in the community. Uh, so uh, a physical lab space is, is not required, um, but, but may be possible if, if there are some arrangements that are made. Um, sorry, could you just repeat that first part of the uh, question again about the extended essay? Yeah, so a uh, number of questions, where students do the research, how they're guided, and if they needed mm -hmm. lab space, what sort of the parameters are. And I and I think you've definitely hit the high That's notes the on that mm -hmm. one. Uh, the big thing being that obviously, uh, maybe you could also expand on the EE advisor so that students sure. know that they, they have a, a friend. Yes, yes. So that is something that uh, as, as we begin the EE process, and as Mr. Harthen has said, uh, that's going to begin in the grade 11 year. And, and it is uh, done quite formally where we will ask all the students uh, which subject area they'd like to, to pursue. And we make sure that every student is matched with a supervisor who can uh, have some expertise in the area of interest, uh, who can guide them along with the process. So I spoke mainly about the sciences earlier, uh, but whatever discipline the student is, is pursuing their EE in, uh, the supervisor will be able to give them tips about, uh, you know, how do you find appropriate sources? How do you make sure that the research question that you're, you're answering is, is uh, going to be valid for the EE? So the supervisor will, will work with the student to make sure that the student is on the right track, uh, knows where they're going to, to get sources, how to find them, can help them perhaps perhaps interpret some of these sources. So there, there's lots of support uh, available there. Thank you. And I have a question for Ms. Dutton because it's come up multiple times and I know she's well connected both here at Marival and at Colonel Bai. Uh, lots of questions about band and music and uh, students who were thinking about uh, opportunities to perhaps either try a new instrument or continue with an instrument that they have. Yes, so so happy to hear that there's interest in band. Uh, both schools do have band available. Um, we have some courses that are 
credit courses for our band. And then we also do offer some ensembles that are extracurricular. Um, what I will say is we do not have an orchestra, so there's no strings offered. And we also do not offer a keyboard class. The program that we offer at the schools is a concert band course. So things like flute, clarinet, saxophone, trumpet, trombone, that sort of thing. Um, what I would say is if you want to know specific details about the ensembles that are offered at each school, um, please do definitely reach out to the music teachers at those schools. They're always happy to talk about what their school has to offer. Um, if it's for Marivelle, uh, it's me, you can email. Um, and the teachers for Colonel By, that information is on the website as well. Um, but they're or me, we'll be happy to answer those questions if you want to know more about it. Thank you so much. We're going to go back to Mr. Harthen, but I do want to flag to all of our uh, viewers that um, clubs and teams and um, affinity spaces uh, are at both schools for students and obviously supported by staff advisors. Mr. Harthen. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Fulton Hill. And so uh, we're through the binding part. Here's, here's another part that perhaps is uh, uniting in some ways homework. I know. Um, so I always like to address this part because it, it comes up and there's there's certainly a lot of questions about how much work is this program. And so um, I would like to talk a little bit about homework because I think it's an important conversation just in general from a high school perspective. Um, so one thing I always like to say before I start talking about homework in the IB program is that um, it's pretty likely that you have homework uh, now at middle school. And so you've probably had some experience doing homework. Um, I can guarantee you that there is homework at high school. And I can guarantee you after high school and post-secondary, there's also homework there. And so um, is there homework in the IB program? Absolutely. Um, and so the usual question for the follow-up is, well, how much? What are we talking about here? And so um, what I would say is that the homework in IB is, is fairly consistent, okay? Um, and usually what that amounts to for most students uh, is somewhere in the neighborhood of about an hour and a half to possibly two hours of homework a night, um, almost every night. It can be pretty consistent and sometimes depends a little bit on course scheduling and makeup as to how that looks. Um, but it is a fairly consistent uh, thing that will come home. In fact, I always... Uh, joke with students when I go to see them is that um, if they go home and they look at the adults and the adults say, do you have anything to do tonight? And you say, no, you're probably lying uh, because you probably do have something to do. In fact, uh, there probably is a little bit of work that you need to get done or to catch up on or maybe to follow up on something in class. And so it is something that's pretty consistent in the IB program. Uh, and ultimately, that kind of consistency and that getting used to things um, comes with time. And I know we know some students um, jump right in and, and they don't feel that. And we know other students do. And so one of the things that we really try to focus on uh, is trying to help students develop their time management skills. And so we really try to focus on um, them being able to adapt to having to do homework uh, regularly. And we have them kind of approach that and say, well, you know, what does that really mean an hour and a half to two hours? And so sometimes when I uh, broach this conversation uh, with kids, I say, how long do you spend on something like TikTok a day? Or how long do you spend texting in the day? Or how long do you do video games for? And then we get a little bit more uncomfortable usually as I ask students that because that's an awkward answer. And so uh, one thing I usually say, and this excites adults a little bit more than it does kids, uh, is I always say, you know what, the video game high scores will probably go down in this program. I will level with you. The texting speed might decrease a little bit, and it might be an extra three days before you find out about the new TikTok video. It does happen. It will still be there. Um, but I know for kids sometimes that comes as a shock. And I know sometimes for adults, they get a little more excited about that actually than kids. Um, so that is kind of the homework piece. There is homework in the program. It does come with the program, but as I say, there's homework in high school. There's homework possibly in that middle school that you're at right now. And there's definitely homework in post-secondary. And so 
I always like to get to this slide and then say, well, okay, well, why would I do this? Because if you're a student sitting at home right now, that might be crossing your mind. Like, why, why am I going to do this? Let's back up and think about everything that we've talked about here, right? We've talked about having to take six different subject groups throughout high school, right? And I may not necessarily have to do that um, if I were in the Ontario high school program. So I have to do this now and I maybe didn't have to before. I have to complete these three core requirements, right? This is a mandatory part. I have to reflect a lot of, uh, about me. I have to think about who I am. And, you know, I'm not sure as a teenager if that's super comfortable, like reflection is hard. and It is hard work for teenagers. It's hard work for adults. And so I have to take part in that. I have to do that. And then, ah, there's that extended essay, 4,000 word research paper. I know you made it sound warm and fuzzy, but it's 4,000 words. Why, why am I going to do that? And, and then that TOK class, I mean, if I came to your school, like you saw how contentious that could be, one raindrop plus one raindrop, or maybe even at home, what color were the shoelaces, right? And so how am I going to grapple with all this? And that, oh, homework, why? And so I think that's probably where I want to sort of take us towards is why you might consider this. Now, there's a variety of reasons uh, to consider this program. And um, I'm going to highlight two. I think there are a lot, um, but I want to focus on two. And one is probably the practical one. And it's, it's maybe perhaps not even my most favorite one, but uh, I do want to highlight the first one. And so that has to do with some of the doors that um, this potentially opens up in a post-secondary world for students. And so what colleges and universities do is they recognize the work that students do in the IB. They recognize the uh, rigor of the program and the challenge of the program. And so for the work that they do in high school, uh, most of our grads get first year college and university credits. And so in other words, they walk in with um, some form of advanced standing. Some universities will go so far as to put students directly into second year for the work that they're doing. And so all of our grads go on and they, they get to go to some of these colleges and universities and get credit for their work. And that might seem like a really awesome thing, and I think it is an awesome thing, but it's actually not my favorite reason. Uh, and my favorite reason is actually this. Uh, and now this might seem like an odd slide, um, but, and it has nothing to do with US Thanksgiving that's coming up. <laughs> it actually has a lot, to, or it could possibly, I suppose, but it has more to do with Canadian Thanksgiving. And so um, the reason I highlight that is that that's usually actually the very first point um, that students come back to see us after they've graduated. So it's the first real break point from post-secondary for most of our students. And so, um, they will come back and see us. And so we, you know, we chat with them. Obviously, we're happy to see them. We're excited to see them back in the building and kind of learn about how life is treating them. But then usually when I'm having that conversation with kids, uh, the question usually ultimately comes up, and it's usually a version of this. I usually look at them and I say, so how's school going, right? Wherever they've gone off to, wherever that might be in the world, and we do have kids go all over the world um, it, with this program, we usually say, well, how's, how's school going? Like, how are things? And the conversation usually goes like this, some version of this. They look at me and they say, you know, it's, it's going really well, actually. It's, um, it's kind of easier than I thought it would be. Um, last week, I was in class and the professor said we had to write a thousand word research paper. And the other kids in the class looked shocked that we'd have to write anything that long. And I, I didn't see the big deal. I've already written a 4,000 word research paper. Like this, this seemed really easy. I'm mostly done. I've, I've got a lot of free time on my hands. So I've, I've joined student government and doing some other stuff. And yeah, I, I, this is really good. And that might sound like, okay, well, that's one conversation, but if you've ever gone through and made that leap from high school to post-secondary, that's also not the most common reaction of most kids when they go to post-secondary for the first year. Um, the reaction is usually, wow, I didn't realize that I have to work after every single class I take in post-secondary, that that's only one part of it and that there's actually a considerable amount of work that happens after every single class. And for our students, they're used to that. They've actually already developed those skills. We've helped develop those skills in them so that when they walk in and they 
encounter something like that, it's one of the simplest things that they've done because they already have those skills developed. When they're challenged uh, at post-secondary, for them, they're thinking, I've, I've actually already encountered this challenge. I know exactly what you want me to do because the skill set that we focus on in the IB curriculum and IB courses is very much like the skill sets that's going to be required for them in that forum I'm, as well. I'm going to interrupt you because this is a ah. perfect, perfect point for me to okay. ask some of the questions about homework because we're still on the skill building, mm -hmm. uh, skill acquisition um, uh, portion of the presentation, but we have seen a lot mm -hmm. of questions uh, in the Q&A section that um, I think are worth exploring um, to just reassure people about uh, the volume of homework, why we do homework, how students uh, and their families balance their academic responsibilities with uh, their well-roundedness, for example, time to do um, activities that uh, bring them happiness and health. And then I'm going to put Mr. Grills on the spot and have him talk about student engagement at school in clubs and teams and things like that, because there's some kiddos who are worried about not having enough time for everything. Mr. Harthen. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. I think it's also something that is very much uh, worth having kids consider and think about. And um, I think it's a great question. And it's also one of the most difficult to answer questions because I find it to be a very uh, individualized question. And so, uh, the reason I say this is that for some students, adding one thing can seem like too much. And for other kids, adding 15 things still might not seem like enough. And so it's it can be very different for each student. What I can tell you is I have uh, seen, and I've been doing this for a very long time, and Ms. fulton Hale can probably attest to that because she's been involved with some IB schools for a really long time as well. Um, and so what I can tell you is that I have seen kids in this program do everything from uh, complete, compete on national teams from an athletics perspective to um, take part in TV productions um, from the arts-based side of things um, to you name it. Um, and so have I seen kids who are able to still be super involved and still be very successful in this program? I absolutely have. And so when somebody asks me, is it possible to still do the things that I love and still be part of this program? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, we want you to keep doing the things that you love um, because one of the parts of this program is we want you to reflect upon why those things that you love make you who you are and why they make you a great person. And so IB isn't just concerned with you doing homework and studying. And I know sometimes that's what we take in as the message, but we're actually really concerned about is we want you to develop and think about is why are some of those other things super important in your life? We actually want you to really take those into consideration. So can you do it? Absolutely. Can I promise you that you can do it all? I, I don't necessarily know all of you individually to say that, but I can tell you that in my experience, it is possible. And maybe I'll turn it over to Mr. Grills to answer that second part. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Arthur. And, and just to, to to build upon that, and I think it really becomes about the balance and and the priority setting. And uh, I would I would absolutely agree that just finding space in our in our lives and the time in our lives to be able to do the things that we enjoy and that make us who we are is is really important. Um, in, in terms of some of the things that we do have to offer, and I've seen a number of questions come up about, uh, do you have tennis and do you have this club or this sport or that? Um, and, and each school is is, is individual and, and we really do have a lot of options and opportunities at, at each school. And so without listing what Maryville has and what Colonel By has and what your home school has, it, it's just important to know that there's going to be a number of, of options and opportunities at, um, at both sites and at all schools, whatever your school options are. Um, and we really do encourage you to, to get involved in a club, in a team, um, in, a, in, in an art endeavor that, that interests you. Because again, that really makes you a well-rounded person. It gives you an opportunity to connect um, with your peers outside of the, outside of the classroom. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hartham, we're going to put it back to you and, and I'll group some more questions. So thanks very much. And so, so yes, ultimately, 
you know, it's 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 one of those pieces that I think uh, is ultimately really fulfilling uh, for students. I think it's something that is important. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to apply if it's a program you're interested in. But um, before we get to that, one of the other questions that come up, and I just I want to address it because um, there's definitely questions that pop up about this. And it's a question of who is this program for? And um, I always like to address it because I think it's important for all families to hear. Um, there are two characteristics that I would say are common to all of the students uh, that we have in the IB program. And the first one is that they like something about learning, that there's something about learning that they like. And the second one is that they're willing to work hard. And so one of the things that I do when I go around and I visit schools, and I, I know this is common to virtually any school I might go in and visit, um, is when I ask the math question, um, we talk about TOK and I do that. As I'm asking the math question, one thing I make a point of is to see um, who's paying attention as I ask the math question. And what I notice at every single school is that every single kid is looking at me. They're all waiting actually for me to ask what the question is. Uh, I have presented to rooms of 200 kids uh, at once in the school and they're all waiting for that question. They're all looking at me. And kids don't do that if they don't like learning. And so I always like to bring this up and I know when I do this with students, they sometimes look at me uh, a little funny, but the reality is that all kids like learning, um, whether they necessarily want to admit it or not. And I know it's not the cool thing. You don't necessarily go out on the playground at recess and talk about how much you like learning today. That's, that's not a thing. We get that. Um, but secretly inside, we know that kids like learning. And so the reality is that that is something that is common to all the kids out there. The other part is that we know that all kids are capable of working hard. Working hard is a choice. And so we all know, we know that kid, all kids are capable of making that choice. And so when I put those two things together, to me, all kids actually satisfy the requirements of being in this program, liking something about learning uh, and being willing to work hard. The next step for them is deciding whether it's the right choice that they want to engage in. And so if it is, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we apply for this program. Okay. So, um, if you go to the OCDSB website or you go to the Colonel By or Merivale websites, um, what you'll find there now as of, uh, as of Monday uh, is the application is up there and available. And so you will actually apply using uh, the link on one of those three web pages. So they all go to the same place. So whichever one you wanna choose uh, is appropriate. So they all go to the same place. We ask that all um, applications as you submit them are submitted from a uh, Google or a Gmail uh, email address. And so we know that, uh, I know for the OCDSB, we our student email addresses are in fact Gmail addresses. And I know for the OCSB that it's actually the exact same thing. Um, for some of the other school boards, you might wanna check if that's actually the case, um, but we do encourage you to use your uh, student uh, Gmail account for that application part. Now. There's a couple of things that um, go into uh, an application, okay? And so a couple of them that I wanna talk about uh, are we ask students to complete an English writing exercise. And so if you were to go onto our websites right now, what you'll find is uh, an English writing exercise that has four photos. And what we're asking uh, applicants to do is to choose one photo to write about. And so on there, there's a few more instructions about uh, what to do once you've chosen it, but it's it's a pretty big free choice in terms of once you've chosen the photo, what you can write. The second thing we ask uh, applicants to do is we ask them to sign up for uh, one of our online math exercises. Now we offer that at uh, two different times. One is uh, during the week and one is on the weekend. And we ask uh, applicants to choose a time that's going to work for them. And so that online math exercise is uh, geared towards the grade level of the student. It's skills-based, so it's not strand or curriculum-based. It's something that they will have seen before in the past. Uh, it's online and it's about an hour in length, an hour in length, and it's completely multiple choice. And students will do that uh, from their own homes. Okay, so 
You have to be there during the time that's there and you will choose one of the uh, times to take part in that exercise. We also ask um, applicants to choose a student uh, or teacher reference. Uh, and so we ask applicants to choose a current teacher. So if you're in grade eight, we're asking you to choose a grade eight teacher. If you're in grade nine, we're asking you to choose a grade nine teacher. And we're asking you to have them, um, to approach them and ask if they would be a reference for you. And so what that reference is going to do is they're gonna tell us a little bit about who you are uh, in the classroom and around the school. Um, and so you get to choose who that person is. And we always encourage uh, applicants to choose the person who they think knows them best. Uh, and we also encourage you to approach that person in advance uh, so that they know, because what will happen is we will get that um, teacher's email address from you and their name, and we actually contact them in January for a reference. And so we do that separately. It's not something that student applicants need to go out and get from uh, a person at that exact time to hand in with their application. The other piece is that we have students complete uh, an application questionnaire. And that questionnaire is really an opportunity for uh, you to tell us a little bit about yourself. We wanna know who you are, um, not in the classroom, but actually outside of the classroom. It could be at school or out in the community. Uh, we wanna know who you are and what you do and why you're excited about possibly being part of this program. And so that application questionnaire is a really great opportunity for uh, applicants to really highlight who they are and let us know who they are. Um, and so we then look at all of that information um, and it's all due on December 20th at 6 p.m. And so all, everything is submitted online by December 20th at 6 p.m. And then we look at everything that uh, comes out there and usually what happens is we're able to uh, go through all of the information that you provide us. And then just before March break, usually we're able to get back to applicants um, with uh, offers of admission. And so usually just before March break, uh, if we're sending you an offer of admission, you'll receive an email. If you don't get an offer of admission from us, what you'll get is an email indicating that you are on our waiting list. And so you'll get an email from us indicating that you're on our waiting list. And then as students who get an offer of admission, either choose to accept or decline, we go through our waiting list at that point. And that can usually take uh, a few weeks uh, for us to get through that entire process. And so that's kind of how our process works. If you are in grade eight right now and you apply uh, and you're not successful uh, this year applying for the program, it's still something you're really interested in you always have the option to apply as a ninth grade student. If you are in ninth grade right now, um, this is the last year that you can apply for the program um, in terms of getting in because you'd have to be part of the pre-diploma program uh, for grade 10 uh, to lead into the IB program. Now, what I wanna say is that this is an incredibly popular program in our school board. Uh, we will likely have uh, across the board over a thousand students apply for this program. Uh, and we are capable of taking, uh, the board allows us to take just over 300 students across the school board uh, into the program. Um, so it is incredibly popular and that's why we have the process in place. Uh, if you're in ninth grade applying for 10th, we will probably have a couple hundred kids apply for that. And spaces for grade 10 are always uh, dependent on space in the program. And so that the amount of spaces we're able to offer there can sometimes vary. Mr. Harthen, before we go too much further, could you spend yeah. some time talking about the language requirements and um, perhaps some of the considerations for families who wish to consider either French immersion to work towards that French immersion diploma or core French and the DELF? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for those of us who are considering applying to French immersion, we ask that you are in French immersion already. Um, so that you have that background because there are requirements uh, for the French immersion program, or possibly you might be at a French school, in which case um, that could be taken into consideration as well because you have the amount of French instruction that you need. Uh, if you're in core French, um, you can of course continue uh, to do core French. We also have um, the option for students to write the DELF here uh, at high school. And so the DELF is a, an exam um, overseen by the French government, actually, and you will get a DELF certification for your language level uh, by the time you leave high school. 
And then we just had a few other questions uh, from families where their student might be coming from um, either private or out of province or uh, virtual or other forms of schooling that is that is perhaps less um, familiar than, than uh, the system that we're working in and to talk about what documentation they might provide that is uh, not an Ontario report card. Yeah, great question. So we we get reporting documents from, quite honestly, all over the world. And so there's maybe not a reporting document we haven't seen either in the application phase or, or somewhere else. And so what we would encourage you to do is to just submit that reporting document that you have available um, to you. And so whatever that might be, if it doesn't look like an Ontario progress report, that's fine. Um, if there is a homeschool uh, situation, which we know is uh, entirely possible, we definitely accept uh, applicants uh, from a homeschooling situation. What we ask you to do is to uh, submit the course of studies that a student would have followed. And we would take that into consideration instead um, during the application process. So um, regardless of where you might be going to school this year, whether it's in a, a building, in a public system, um, independent system, or any system, uh, we're willing to uh, look at your application and we just ask you to submit what you have in that situation. And uh, one of the other topics that we didn't really touch on, but um, is relevant to a number of families is, could you talk about students uh, who uh, learn with an IEP and how we support them in IB? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. That's a great question. So um, when we have a student join the IB program uh, who has an IEP, we provide all of the accommodations that are uh, required by the IEP. So we know that uh, students need uh, have different learning needs and we meet them all in the IB program. And so as part of that, what happens ultimately uh, once you get into the later years of IB is we actually submit uh, those learning needs to the IBO or the IB organization. Um, and they would then also take into account those learning needs and, and adjust um, final tasks based on that um, in during examinations and things of that sort. So if you do have a learning need, we, we definitely address that and take care of that and support students. And so at high school, we have a lot of different supports, both your classroom teacher, uh, guidance counselor, learning support teacher, student support teacher. And so we have a lot of different uh, mechanisms in place to help students who might have uh, IEPs or individual education plans. So definitely well supported within the program. And uh, I can say confidently throughout the years, we have many students who have graduated from this program with IEPs. So it's, it's definitely not, uh, a barrier to students being successful in this program. Do we have another slide or can I keep asking you questions? No, I think we're at the question section. I just wanted to put up, because I know some families might have questions that might be better suited if they're very personal uh, to an email uh, rather than us answering it here. So. Um, we are going to move to our question and answer section. So thank you folks for um, for listening. And as I say up here, if you have a very personalized question that's very specific to your child or student, uh, we would ask that you direct it to one of the email addresses there on the screen. But otherwise, I think we're going to have a look at our Q&A, which uh, I've just had a look at is very full. I've, I've been uh, reading the questions. Directed. I've been reading the questions as, as the presentation has been happening. So I've got a, a few uh, ready to go. Um, I think uh, first things first, there were a lot of questions about uh, selecting a teacher reference, why we're looking for a grade eight teacher. So I think uh, when we talk about concurrency of learning, maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, so the reason we ask for a current teacher, a grade eight teacher, um, is that as a learner, um, we feel like you have grown. And so the person that you were in grade seven um, is not the person that you are right now in grade eight, because there's been a significant amount of time that's actually happened in there. And so um, what we're looking for is a teacher in grade eight who can kind of see you, if you want to think of it this way, kind of uh, at the peak of your powers, because your powers are kind of developing in a learning sense uh, consistently. And so we think that that grade eight teacher is the person who's best placed to tell us about uh, who you are. And so they've had an opportunity by this point to spend uh, about three months actually uh, with students and get to know them. 
Um, and so we'll be asking them for that reference, just so everybody's aware, later on in January. So there's actually going to be even a little bit more time that passes there um, in, in terms of before they make that reference. But yeah, from a learning perspective, we really want to get a, a snapshot and idea of who you are right now, um, because we think that you're a much greater learner right now than you would have been in grade seven. Even if you maybe think, I think that person knows me better, we know that this version of you is probably best known by your current teacher. And uh, a lot of questions popping up uh, in the Q&A on which um, reporting document we're asking for. And we are asking for your most recent progress report. So your grade eight progress report uh, from this current school year or your grade nine progress report from this school year. Um, and uh, Mr. Harthen, we only want one teacher reference. Correct. Correct. And um, Mr. Grills, we've had a number of questions about transportation uh, to and from the IB schools. I wonder if you would like to address how student transportation is identified and assigned. Great, thanks Jean. So in terms of student transportation, um, if you live more than 3.2 kilometers away from your school site, you are eligible for transportation to that site. Um, the, what the transportation is, is up to the, the discretion of OSTA. Um, so typically that would come in the form of a Presto Pass um, for areas that are serviced by OC Transpo. Um, we, um, we do have some areas in Colonel By that are serviced by vans, but those are areas where uh, there isn't OC Transpo. So most students would get um, an OC Transpo Presto Pass for, uh, for transportation to the school. Um, for that distance of more than 3.2 kilometers from the school. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Harthen and Ms. Lee are our two experts on this next question. Uh, families want to know if it is one process, two processes, and um, whether uh, we are um, removing identifiers from standardized documents such as report cards. I, I'm going to let Miss Lee answer this because she is the expert uh, in that field for us in this application process. Miss Lee? Uh, sure. So it's one application process, whether you're applying to Merivale or to Colonel By, it's exactly the same application, and you're going to indicate. Uh, in the application, which school it is that you're applying to. And I'll just uh, remind everyone that that is determined by your home address. So please do check the Ivy School locator to make sure that you are selecting the program that matches uh, with, with your home address. Uh, we do ask that the application be kept uh, anonymous as much as possible because we want to make sure that this process is, is fair and equitable and we're evaluating each application on its own merits. So for that reason, we're asking you to please not put your name um, on any of the, the writing samples, don't name the file uh, with your name. Uh, we know that the name of the student is on the report card. That's okay. You don't need to white that out or anything like that because we look at that separately from, from when we're examining the rest of the application. So you don't need to go to great lengths to like hide that name on, on the uh, uh, report card. And again, don't worry about it if as you uh, upload your Google document, you say, oh, it's attached to my, my Gmail address. That's fine. Just don't put the name in the actual file name or, or typed on the page anywhere so that we make sure that it's um, anonymous as we are looking at those applications. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've had some questions about uh, the difference between the International Baccalaureate Program and AP courses. Mr. Harthen, did you wanna take that one? Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the things I think that's uh, important, so AP stands for Advanced Placement, IB obviously International Baccalaureate. Um, and so there is a marked difference between um, IB and AP, and, th and that is that the International Baccalaureate is, uh, is a program. In other words, you must uh, complete certain requirements. Uh, you must complete the six courses. Uh, you must complete the core requirements uh, in order to graduate with the IB diploma. Uh, advanced placement, uh, the way that it tends to work is that students write an exam uh, at the end of their high school course uh, and thereby um, complete the AP requirement. There's uh, nothing that really binds the AP courses together. They, they're very separate entities. And so 
uh, IB itself is actually, it's, it's a genuine cohesive program, whereas AP tends to be a little bit more uh, subject specific and students can opt into particular subjects rather than um, that sort of more wholesome um, programming element that IB would present. Thank you. Uh, we do have a number of people asking questions about specific courses. I wonder if you'd like to talk to families about where they would find that information because um, we do have, of course, elective options for students to access that are separate from their IB pathways. And then I have another question for Mr. Grills. Yeah, so students uh, in their course selections, uh, while they will choose some courses that are uh, specific to their IB program studies, um, they could also choose um, certain elective courses which might fulfill um, something that they are interested in or want to learn more about or are passionate about. And so when we um, send out student option sheets, um, those will be indicated on those uh, particular option sheets where students can choose uh, other courses um, to take as elective classes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Grills, putting you back on uh, the spot. Uh, a number of questions wanting to know um, how the IB program is integrated into the school and if uh, there are separate zones in the school or, or how that works. So, so definitely not separate zones. Um, I can walk through the hall and not actually be able to tell you who our IB learners are and who our Ontario students are. Um, we have classes that are side by side. Um, there are courses that students uh, in the IB program do take together. Uh, then there are courses that they take with the, the students that are in the Ontario program. So um, they, they really run in parallel to one another. This, the school day, the timing of the school day is exactly the same. Everyone has the same shared lunch hour. Um, so there's, there's no differences there. Um, and again, so you've got your, um, your core courses that you would have with your IB learners or with your Ontario students, and then you have your courses that are together. Great. Um, so we also have uh, some questions from families who are uh, applying from outside of Ottawa. And uh, so Mr. Harthen, could you talk about a residential address and residential address at the time of entry to the program? Yeah, great question. So we know that uh, we definitely do have families apply from uh, outside of the city of Ottawa and some who might be uh, moving back to Ottawa or, or there are obviously a variety of different circumstances. And so um, you do need to reside within Ottawa Carleton. There are a few rules for being out of, of boundary. And if that does potentially apply to your situation, I'm going to encourage you to specifically email us. But what I will say for our families who are possibly uh, moving back into the city and they know that they'll be in the city of Ottawa, but they aren't currently there, uh, we do require you to kind of uh, choose a school and kind of a zone uh, that will abide by that school to live in during your application. So uh, if you are moving back into the city and you are fairly certain that you want to apply to either Maryville or Colonel Bay, or, or that's kind of what you're doing. Um, we do need you to kind of find a home in that particular part. We do have the ability every once in a while to facilitate a transfer between the two schools, but it, it's very space dependent and can be um, very difficult. It's always based on your geographic address, but uh, it can be very difficult. But if that does apply to you, we really encourage you to email us because each situation is very specific. Uh, so one more question about transfers generally. We do have um, families often that are coming from an Ivy World School or may need to uh, think about being able to go to an Ivy World School. Could you explain that process? For sure. And so um, the process, uh, if you are currently in grade eight and look at an Ivy World School and looking to come to either Colonel By or Maryville, as we still ask you to engage in our application process the way that we've outlined it today. Uh, if you're already part of a, a high school that offers the IB program, uh, there is an application link where you can indicate that, and it's a separate link on our page. Uh, for you to follow. And so you would request an IB World School transfer, and then we have a particular process uh, around how you can do that, that you can find at that particular link, uh, respecting the fact that you have possibly already been admitted to an IB World School there. And so as far as the world goes, we are really are, we really are a community of IB World Schools. And so 
We always like to uh, honor the commitment other schools have made to IB learners where possible space permitting in our programs. Great. Uh, so this question is for the coordinators and each may have a perspective, but a, a number of students have been uh, sharing questions about uh, the impact of COVID and their opportunity to be engaged in ec extracurriculars and um, what some considerations might be extended to students as they uh, draft their application and, and why we want them to share what they, they do do and perhaps uh, provide some parameters. Ms. Lee, do you wanna go first? I'll let, I'll let, then we'll go over to Ms. Dutton perhaps. Okay, oh, sure. Um, sure. So we know that uh, certainly COVID has has impacted the the types of activities that families and students may be engaged in, um, and and that's why really the the question is uh, quite open. It's it's not so much about a specific activity. I've had students come up and ask me, you know, are you is there some specific activity that's valued more than others? No, not at all. And it it uh, relates a lot to what Mr. Harthen was talking about earlier. Uh, in that we want to see how the activities that you have engaged in have shaped you. So these could be uh, clubs that you might have been involved in while you were at school, whether they were in person or whether they were virtual. Um, it's really just sort of anything that you're doing outside of your regular class existence in school. What are you doing outside of that? And how does that shape who you are as a person? What what have you uh, learned from that? How have you grown as an individual? Uh, and how do you expect that you will continue to grow and change uh, throughout your high school years? Uh, so we're not looking for any particular activity uh, in in particular, uh, just what's meaningful to you and, and uh, how have you grown from the experiences that you've had so far? Ms. Dutton, did you wanna add anything to Ms. Lee's answer there? Yeah, I think that everything Ms. Lee said, I 100% agree with. Um, as someone who teaches in a subject area that was heavily impacted by COVID, uh, definitely we understand. Um, but I would even say it doesn't have to be something that you've been doing for years and years. It can be something that you just joined this year, as a lot of things are coming back this year. So it may be something that you just started in like September or October, and that's okay. Um, but we are definitely aware that COVID has impacted some of the activities that have been available to students at school. All right. Um, so a number of students are asking... Um, and um, as a mom, I know sometimes I nudge uh, a question or two, um, want to know how they can study or prepare or somehow um, get, get uh, started, launched on their application and if there's something special they should be doing. Yeah, great question. And um, I, I have had a few emails actually asking uh, me this very question. And, um, in terms of preparing um, for some of the exercises, the, the math exercise or the English exercise, um, there's no real extra preparation to do that is going to uh, have an impact on either of those tasks. They're very skills oriented. And so the work that you're truly doing in your classes right now is more than adequate preparation for what those exercises and tasks are. Uh, there's no need to kind of have a study session about what's going to be on any that's not really how those exercises or tasks are uh, developed in mind it's really based on um, what students are actually already sort of doing in class and in school so um, no real way to get that uh, jump start or head start um, and as i say the application is up online so we we do encourage families to have a look at it but nothing really special that they need to do right now Are there any comments from anyone on the panel about um, building that balance uh, between school, homework, and personal activities uh, that people want to make? Because uh, the question about homework and volumes of homework keeps coming up, and, and perhaps we want to talk about some of the organizational skills that we work on at school. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think this is, I will say it this way, I think like anything in life, it's kind of finding a balance of things. So I think 
perhaps the adults at home, um, some, of, some of them might know this well, um, who perhaps might have work obligations or different things and are trying to juggle that with uh, their family life and perhaps you know, fam uh, looking at other things that they might be involved in. And, and so it is definitely a, a process that, that we try to support and help kids find their uh, way into figuring out where that fits with them and, and how that fits. And I know it's uh, a bit of a, a puzzle there. And um, it's definitely one that we try to help guide students with. And so at the high school level, one of the things that we're really fortunate to have uh, are some dedicated guidance counselors who actually help kids um, think about what their uh, day will be like, what their year will be like, and, and really work with them in terms of finding some of that balance. And so they always have um, a professional that they can turn to, to ask questions, uh, to think about different strategies. And we have different professionals on site at school uh, who help do that. Now, um, I know other people are parents on this panel and might be able to speak a little bit more to that, um, but I would definitely invite other folks to kind of talk about that uh, who, who have high school kids or anything of that sort. I have a feeling you might be directing that at me <laughs> as, uh, as a parent of uh, a couple of kids who have uh, gone through or are currently going through the program. Uh, it is a balancing act and it does involve uh, making choices sometimes. Uh, and, and there are times a year that are, are busier than others. And, and as we've talked about throughout this presentation, uh, this can be true of, of any high school program. Uh, there, there's going to be uh, work involved and there's going to be times uh, when it's busy. And, and this is a really important skill for all of our students to learn is uh, how, to, how to manage that workload and, and how to uh, sometimes let go of the work and say, uh, this is this is what I can do with the time that I have, and this is uh, uh, enough. And I need to make sure that I can fit in the other things. And certainly, part of that is achieving that balance of uh, it's not all about homework all the time, but it is important to take time uh, to to spend time with family, to do things that uh, fulfill you personally, to to just have uh, you know time to to rest and relax and eat well and all those good things. And we definitely encourage all of those things among our students uh, in the program as well. Any other uh, comments on um, homework, school, personal life balance? Um, so uh, Mr. Harthen, we have quite a few questions about applicants to the 10th grade and uh, what some of uh, the expectations would be for students who um, would be joining the program in the pre-DP in grade 10? Yeah, great question. And so um, we do have a number of applicants who are in ninth grade and who will apply for, for 10th grade and, and join us in 10th grade. And um, one of the things that we uh, work with them uh, to do is to kind of uh, get their skills um, developed in a way that we know will lead to success in the IB program. And so. Um, kids who come in uh, to the ninth uh, as ninth grade applicants for 10th grade, we really spend uh, a good amount of time um, trying to focus on developing skills, but also potentially addressing um, different um, gaps that might exist from a curriculum perspective. So I know sometimes, depending on the level of math that some of our students might want to access, uh, we might uh, require them to take a course before joining us if they really want to um, access a particular level of math. So there can be sometimes requirements of that sort. Um, but really what happens is in 10th grade, we try to get you to that point where you feel comfortable um, to continue on to the diploma program in the 11th. And we do that with through the works uh, of our teachers and, and frankly through students. One of the things that I love about this program is that um, kids support kids in this program. And it's a very supportive atmosphere. Um, and so everybody helps everybody kind of achieve that level. Right. Um, 
I just saw a question that I wanted us to talk about. Um, let me go back and find it. Uh, so uh, it has to do with students who perhaps uh, spend one or two years in a diploma program and then for um, reasons of their own wish to make a different choice. And uh, how do we support families uh, as they make those choices? Yeah, for sure. So. Um, we do have students who um, join the program and at times decide that for whatever reason uh, it's not working for them. Uh, and so we support students in uh, transitioning from the IB program to the Ontario program. And so uh, we have different points in the year where uh, we encourage students to, to think about that. Um, and so our guidance team would work with families um, to potentially transition them from the IB program to the Ontario program, uh, if that is what is in their best interest. One thing I do want to address as we talk about this, because I think it's important, because I know it does also come up as a question, um, and there's sometimes a, a thought process here that you have to maintain a certain average in the program or, or perform at a certain level in the program or uh, we kick you out. And what I do want to address that really quickly, um, we do not kick students out um, from an academic perspective in this program. In fact, what I can tell you uh, is that if uh, I were to ever meet with you and we were talking about the program, I actually only ask two questions um, when I talk about the program with students. Uh, I ask them if they feel like they're learning and if they're enjoying it. And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, then I'm a happy coordinator. Um, if the answer to any of those questions is no, then we should have a conversation because something's not working. And so I don't attach that feeling to grades. Uh, I attach that to how a person's individual needs are being met. And so for me, it's a very particular way of learning in the IB program. And so we wanna make sure that the people in it are happy and feel like they're learning. For us, that's probably the most important piece. But if that piece does come to an answer of no at some point, we definitely have a team uh, of folks who can help you uh, transition into the Ontario program as an option. Great. Um, here's another question. We can uh, tell kids are thinking about balance and opportunities. Uh, there are sometimes uh, opportunities for students to participate in student exchanges and, and other uh, experiential learning opportunities. And uh, how do students balance that um, while they are an IB student? Yeah, the exchanges piece um, is definitely something that we are okay with and, and would potentially encourage. What we will say is that um, those exchanges are usually, unless they're with another IB World school, um, those exchanges are usually uh, something that we would promote more as an idea in the ninth or 10th grade than in the 11th or 12th, because in the 11th or 12th, uh, the IB diploma program has a certain hours requirement that students must uh, be with us uh, and taking uh, courses and so seat hours. So in ninth and 10th grade, it's certainly something that we would work with you if you're looking to go on an exchange somewhere. Um, but if it is a lengthier exchange in 11th and 12th grade, that's probably something that uh, we should talk about uh, because if it's not with another IB World School, there could be some complicating factors there. Great. Um, I am not sure if uh, you wish to delve any further into the application process, but there are a number of questions, um, some technical and, and some having to do with uh, absolute curiosity, which we definitely appreciate. Uh, about the math task and uh, the written uh, English task and how um, students manage that from home. So I'll talk about the math test from home, uh, the English the English writing exercise. Um, obviously, you will get that, and uh, there are instructions there in the application piece. So we would ask for the English writing exercise. Um, you would type your response and save it as a PDF and you'll upload it as part of your application. For the math exercise, uh, what will happen is you will choose a date and time um, that fits in your schedule uh, to do the math exercise. And what will happen is 
uh, before the, usually the day before the math exercise, we will send you uh, a link to access the math exercise. And so it becomes live at the time of the test. And so at the time of that testing exercise, you would be able to log in and begin that exercise. And so that would last for the hour, you submit your answers, um, and then that is complete. So that from a process perspective, that's how it would work. You would indicate to us the time that you wish to take the exercise, and, and then we would go from there and contacting you. Okay, Mr. Grills, this one's for you. Do students in the IBDP still have to do EQAO? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. So the EQAO so um, is a, a ministry assessment that is done, and that's done by all grade nine students, uh, regardless of being in the IB program or in the Ontario curriculum. All right. Um, I think we have covered most of the questions. Uh, one thing I am going to come back to is um, language two. And could you talk about why we focus on French and Spanish? For sure. So um, French uh, might seem a little bit obvious being uh, this being Ottawa, but um, we have a very robust background in, in French, uh, be it at the immersion level or core level uh, here in the nation's capital. And so French is something that we focus on because we know that our students uh, have a background in it and definitely have an interest in it. And some of our students have uh, been trying to earn the French immersion certificate or may have been part of an immersion program for a long time. So we know um, that it's something that from a community perspective, uh, we would like to support in the OCDSB and in the IB program. Um, from a Spanish perspective, um, Spanish was a choice because uh, in the IB, and this is something that I didn't mention during the presentation, but it's worth noting, uh, IB has three official languages and definitely recognize many more, but the three official languages of the IBO are English, French, and Spanish. And because Spanish is one of the uh, most popular working languages in the world, that is our other focus in the program uh, in terms of language choices. So for us, it is French and Spanish uh, that we focus on. All right, uh, Ms. Dutton, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit for student course electives and some of the opportunities that students might be able to explore uh, in both their pre-DP years and then as they go to the DP and are able to pick um, optional courses. Yes, there's definitely opportunity in high school to choose an elective course that is of interest to you. Um, when you come in in grade nine, there's not quite as many options for electives, but there are still some options available to you. Um, and those will all be uh, given to you, that information will be provided during course selection time. And as you work your way through high school, um, when, when you start the IB program in grade 11, there is still an opportunity to take some elective courses in addition to your IB courses. So those options are definitely there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harthen, we may as well um, stare this question in the eye do we recommend summer school before grade nine? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, I, I do not recommend summer school before grade nine. And so um, there's a couple of reasons for that. We do know that there are some offerings uh, where kids might take a high school course before coming in. But one of the things that we do in um, our high school courses here, and you heard Mr. Grills talk about it, we have some courses that uh, our IB students take with our Ontario students and some that are IB specific in that they work with their own IB cohorts. And so all of our classes that are IB cohort classes are working on a very particular skill set uh, in order to prepare them for future options in the diploma program. And so whether that's research or some hands-on stuff, um, it's really imperative to us and we know uh, to the success of students in the program um, that they be in those particular courses because of the different emphasis and skill set. So uh, even though a student might be able to complete, I'll give an example, um, their grade nine geography credit uh, at, at summer school potentially, um, we have a grade nine pre-DP 
geography course that we want that student to take uh, from a skill set perspective because it, it's going to be a different focus and emphasis and similar questions with math and things of that sort. So we do have different emphases in those courses. Uh, and so as much as we know some students get in high school and, t and take that summer school credit before they come to us, um, we're going to say, please hold on uh, to that and instead um, just enjoy the summer without uh, summer school being part of it. We know there are other options for academic enrichment if that's what somebody's after, but we're going to say uh, no to the summer school option before the IB program starts in ninth grade. All right. And another uh, question of great interest to people is um, the deadline for their application. And so can you talk about the window for people to submit their applications? For sure. So uh, if you were to go to our website right now, what you'll see is you could actually submit uh, an application right now tonight if you really wanted to, um, because it's it's open now. We don't expect anybody to submit an application tonight. And I want to assure everybody it's, it's not like a if I submit all my stuff first, I get like, you know, a better consideration than anybody else. Please take your time with the application and submit submit it once it's done. But um, that link uh, to submit your application will remain open till uh, December 20th at 6 p.m. And so we try to give you uh, just about, just under a month, I think it is, um, to either gather the documents or to uh, approach a teacher reference and have a conversation with them or to write your English writing exercise uh, or think about your answers on that application questionnaire. So we want to give students, uh, student applicants, a, a good amount of time to consider everything that uh, they're going to do uh, and to maybe have conversations with their family about, about where this might fit in, in their particular world. So um, you can submit everything all the way up to December 20th at, at 6 p.m. And there were a few questions for students coming from uh, French boards about documents arriving in French. Would you like to speak to that? For sure. So if your reporting document is in French, that's quite okay. We, we understand, not a problem. We do ask that you complete the application questionnaire and the English writing exercise in, in English. Um, but otherwise, if it's a reporting document or um, anything of that sort, we're happy to uh, accept that uh, in French. So that part's not a problem, but we do ask that the English writing exercise and application questionnaire be uh, completed in English. And uh, could you address this question about whether or not there is online opportunities for IB um, or virtual school? Absolutely. So um, the IB program is only offered in person. Um, there's a lot of particular reasons for that, but one of the uh, major ones is that all of our teachers in grade 11 and 12 who are here uh, as in-person teachers uh, are trained IB teachers. And so uh, they have all attended uh, IB workshops for very specific training in their subjects uh, in order to prepare students. And so all of our uh, teachers, whether it be at Colonel Byer or Maryville, who are teaching in the 11th or 12th grade of the program, have very subject specific training uh, in order to uh, teach students. And so we don't have that option available online. It's only available uh, at the actual sites. So if you are applying to this program, it should be with the full intention and full knowledge uh, that you have to attend either Colonel Byer or Maryville uh, to be part of it. All right. Uh, there are also a number of questions uh, about uh, look fors. And I think what I'd like to say first, and I'll certainly turn it over to you later, is that what we're looking for is students to uh, be thoughtful and reflective as they complete that application and have it reflect them as a student. But over to the coordinators. Miss Lee, would you like to, I know you've read your fair share, so maybe talk about some of that stuff. Yeah, I'll just echo what uh, Ms. Fulton Hale said that uh, we we want to hear the student voice in in this uh, response. We want to uh, sort of get to know you through through that application questionnaire. Uh, so please, um, you know, take some time, as Mr. Harthen said, take some time to uh, formulate your response. You should go over it. Uh, think of it as a piece of work that you really want to present yourself in in the best light. Um, 
but uh, we we just want to hear about about who you are and and uh, what you think about yourself as a learner and why you think the IB program is is right for you, what you think you're going to get out of it, what you think you're going to bring to it. Um, that just just do your best, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions uh, from families about affinity spaces for students who might identify LGBTQ2 as plus, and I wonder if anyone would like to speak to um, those safe spaces in our schools. Maybe Mr. Grills would like to start off. Yeah, absolutely, Jean. And, and so I think it's important to recognize that that we're a school and we're a school environment that where everyone is welcome. And, and when students and staff and, and community members come into our school, they bring their identity with them. So um, we are a very welcoming environment and uh, we're always looking for for ways to improve. And uh, but there's there's really um, th there's no th there's no rewind that that, that sentence. Um, we're, we really um, have a place for for everyone here. Um, we're we're always looking for for ways to support all learners and and it and, and again there it goes beyond the 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 gender neutral washrooms and the the open gym classes uh, we really look to to find ways that that students and can see themselves reflected in in the staff and in the the curriculum and the materials and um, what we have on on the walls in the school so yeah thank um, you uh, sorry I was just like. Go ahead, Mr. Hearth, and then I'm going to get. I'm just going to add talk. because I think it's. Um, I just think it's important. I know I've mentioned this phrase uh, before, but I do think that um, diversity is uh, at the heart of what IB is about. And so I'll go back to that mission statement uh, that I talked about a little bit when I talked about theory of knowledge class. But um, part of the IB mission statement is that others with their differences might also be right. And so. One of the things that we encourage all people, and I know it happens at both schools and in the entire community where we encourage this, um, is we encourage people to consider different perspectives that uh, maybe are not like their own, but to understand how they are important perspectives and, and how we all bring something interesting uh, and fun to our, to our environments. And so to get to know other people and to kind of understand them for who they are is a really key part of being in the IB program. So we, we really do want to respect um, all, all of those things uh, together. Ms. Dutton, did you want to comment at all on Maribel? Um, yeah, I would just echo everything that everyone else has said that, um, we really do focus on making sure our environment is a safe place for all students and, and everyone is welcome. Thank you. Um, and that includes uh, in both schools, obviously, uh, clubs and student activities that support students' lived experience. And, and certainly uh, we wanna make sure that families hear that too. Um, Mr. Harthen, there's been a lot of questions about um, pieces that are evaluated, and I think I would like to start this off before I hand it over to you by saying that um, when we ask families to submit a multi-part um, application, it means that all parts are considered, but over to you. Absolutely, yes. And so we look at everything. Um, so if we ask you to submit it, we're, we're having a look at it. Uh, and considering it as part of the process. Um, I think probably what's what's maybe being asked there is, uh, is there one part that's more important than the other, uh, which is usually uh, where that question tends to go. Uh, and the answer is genuinely no. Uh, we look at everything, much like I said that the program is uh, about being well-rounded. Uh, we look at the application process as being well-rounded. And so, uh, we know that some kids might feel like they excel more at other areas than, than something else, and that's okay. We expect that, uh, in fact, in an application. Um, so for us, no, there's not one magic piece that will get you into this program, and there's not one magic thing that keeps you out. We really do consider everything. And um, to echo what Miss Lee said a little bit earlier, um, we're really, well, one thing I would say that we really do look for is student voice. We want to get to know uh, you and who you are and why you're maybe passionate or considering this program. And, and, and so that's kind of, if you want to look for, what are we looking for? That is probably the one thing that we are looking for, but we do look at everything. So we're looking for that authentic student voice. Awesome. 
All right, there are some questions in the chat that are very individual and I am gonna encourage those families to um, direct their question to the IB coordinators through the coordinator emails, either IB Colonel By or IB Marivel at ocdsb.ca. And um, we are at time, it is 8.35. We know that families uh, have lots of choices in their evening and we appreciate that you chose to spend uh, tonight with us. Uh, if you do have individual questions that uh, we weren't able to get to tonight, please do direct them to the schools. We're happy to address those uh, as best we can. And also, um, we want to make sure uh, that families know this webinar was recorded and will be posted to the board website and the two school websites for families to reference um, between now and the 20th of December as needed. Uh, it will take about 24 hours uh, for us to do all of that processing and uh, get it up on the website. And I do want to take a moment to also thank uh, the OCDSB communications team, which supported our Zoom webinar tonight, and uh, our colleague Joe, whose uh, technical wizardry is very appreciated, uh, particularly by me, but by everyone on the panel, generally speaking. Um, uh, an application and uh, participation in an IBDP program is a, a full family commitment. Um, anyone with um, kiddos at home knows that uh, parents and guardians are, are critical uh, and a caring adult is critical uh, to a student's success because there will be after school activities and before school activities and opportunities uh, to move band instruments from one place to another. And uh, we always know and appreciate um, the commitment that all families make when they make this choice. Uh, Mr. Harthen, Mr. Grills, uh, coordinators, uh, Ms. Lee and Ms. Dutton, any comments? No, I would just uh, echo much of what you've said and say thank you very much for, for spending some time with us uh, this evening. And we do hope that you consider the program as, as one of your options for, for high school and um, for the thousands of you that will apply, we look forward to reading uh, and getting to know you a little bit uh, in, in that particular way. And so um, thanks again. We, we do appreciate uh, your time this evening. Great. And just again, to echo what everyone else has said, thanks for your time tonight. And please uh, feel free to, to visit the website and, uh, and don't forget to reach out if you do have additional questions. Ms. Dutton? Any final last words? Uh, no, I just echo what everyone else has already said. Please don't hesitate to reach out uh, if you have questions. Miss Lee? Nothing to add here. Again, thanks everyone for spending time here tonight. Thank you uh, to all families who joined us and uh,